So folks, I kind of thought this would be a nice sort of um, reprieve, if you will, from what's going on right now with all of the conversation that's all over the place about the Biden debate situation. And, you know, one thing I just have to say about that is um, it still might be too early to kind of draw these kinds of conclusions because we're not getting a lot of polling information. And let's face it, when you do get a poll, take a look at how many people they have polled. A lot of cases, we're talking 1,000, you know, 1,200 people. And you can't make decisions from one poll or another poll that affect an American nation that has over 300 million people, you know, with a sample size of 1,000 or 1,200. So, yes, it pulls you in. It's a whirlpool. I get it. I get sucked into it. But it's kind of nice to push away from that every now and again, folks. And this interview, I thought... uh you know, might accomplish that. So this is Ivanka Trump. She's being interviewed by podcaster Lex Fridman. And keep in mind, this is about a three-hour interview that she's done. It was incredibly painful to kind of sit through that. The whole time she's talking about things like working with her father as a skyscraper developer. And I thought it was kind of interesting that here they are. She's talking about Trump Tower in Chicago, on the Chicago River. And it's like, what can they really do? I mean, it's all glass and steel, isn't it? I mean, and it goes up. Yeah, we want it to be the tallest. I mean, that's about all they can do. You know, we want we want the tallest, the biggest. It's glass and steel. I mean, there's nothing architecturally redeeming about it. It kind of reminds me of a variation of the 1960s architecture, you know, which was glass and steel, but square. So she's sitting in this building that they've constructed, you know, with her father, and she's waxing poetic about what it means to build skylines and this kind of thing. And here she is sitting in a glass and steel monolithic, you know, piece of garbage, really. And as she's sitting there, she's looking out and she sees Wrigley Building, you know, a, a beautiful building designed by Graham Anderson Probst in white classic design. I mean, truly beautiful. When you look at it, you're you're amazed, you're astounded. And everybody agrees that it's beautiful. That's why it's still there. And then you look over at, she looks over, she says, while she was sitting in the Trump Tower, she looks over at the Chicago, Chicago Tribune building with that Gothic architecture, you know, with the buttresses and gargoyles on it, all this kind of stuff. You know, and she's just sitting there, you know, in just amaze, amazement, you know, at, at the, at, at the buildings in front of her and the, uh, you know, how it, it's sort of like here, she's, she's helping recreate the skyline and she's sitting in this, you know, this huge building of just steel and glass, you know, that's just despicable to look at. It goes up, it has a platform, it goes up again, and then it goes up, you know, really, what, what is architecturally redeeming about Trump Tower in Chicago? Nothing. Nothing. So then she goes on and she talks about, now this is three hours, you know, and she talks about certain situations where she's in the campaign and she, she meets people and she's just astounded. They just tell me the stories. And she's thinking that she's getting a, a, a good cross-section of America, you know, in these Trump rallies, which, you know, let's face it, that is not a good cross-section. There's there's people that follow these Trump rallies as they go around. She's probably talking to the same people and doesn't even know it. And then she goes in to talk about how when she's designing clothes and jewelry and handbags, you know, for the common everyday working woman, she's, you know, she talks, the working woman. And let's face it, these, these women that she's creating these handbags and, and jewelry and clothing for, their income must at least start at 500000 and then go up into the millions. And, and she feels that connection with the working woman, you know, which it just shows you how detached they are. <laughs> and then we get to this point, folks, where I swear she's talking about her father in this. She's talking about a principle in Judaism called Lashon Hara. 
and that takes us to right now. Let me play this for you. And I swear that she's talking about her father in a way that she's trying to differentiate herself from how he is. And she goes into how it tears you down and how it's, it's, it's sinful. But there's two levels to this, folks, and I'll show you the other level. There's Lashon Hara, and then there's another one, which is more, even more damnable in Ju Judaism. So have a listen to this. And, you know, I, I think part of me also internalized, there's a concept in Judaism called Lashon Hara, which is translated into, I think, quite literally evil speech. And the idea that, you know, speaking poorly of another is almost the moral equivalent to murder because mm. you can't really repair it. You no. can apologize, but you can't repair it. Another component of that is that it does as much damage to the person saying the words um, than it does to the person receiving them. And I think about that a lot. I talk about this concept with, with my kids a lot. Um, and I'm not willing to pay the price of that fleeting and momentary satisfaction of, of sort of swinging back because I think it would be, it would be too expensive for my soul. And, and that's how I kind of made peace with it because I think that's just, that feels more true for me. But it is a little bit contrary in politics. It's, uh, it's definitely, um, it's definitely a contrarian viewpoint <laughs> um, to, to not get into the fray. I actually, someday I love Dolly Parton says that um, she doesn't condemn or criticize. She loves and accepts. Mm. And I like that. It feels, it feels right for me. I kind of like the way that she, she touches on politics and then she runs like hell. <laughs> Don't ask me about my dad, please. You know, and this came very late in the interview and she's probably thinking, please, please don't ask me about my dad and how this relates to my father, which is naturally the next question that you would ask. Right. But Lex Fridman is obviously a friend of hers, so they didn't get into it. But take a look at this, folks. So this is Wikipedia. And this is what they say about Lashon Hara. If it says something negative about a, a person or party is not seriously intended to correct or improve a negative situation and is true. It's considered to be Lashon Hara. Statements that fit this description are considered to be Lashon Hara, regardless of the method of communication that is used, whether it is through face-to-face -face conversation, a letter, telephone, email, or tweet. No, I added that part. But the second layer to this, folks, by contrast, it says... There's something called Hot Zat Shemra, spreading a bad name. Also called Hot Zat Deba or Matsi Shemra. I'm trying to pronounce it as best I can. I'm not Jewish, but I'm trying to pronounce it. So that consists of lies and is best translated as slander or defamation. Hot Zat Shemra is an even graver sin than Lashon Hara. So I think... In my view, Donald Trump is actually, although I believe she's talking about her father here, and she's drawing a contrast to how he is and how she's trying to lead her life. And good for her in that respect anyway. But I think her father is actually guilty of Hatsat Shemra, an even graver sin, folks. Slander defamation. Look at what he said. This is just an hour ago. Trump campaign statement on the total collapse of the Democratic Party. Every Democrat who was calling on crooked Joe Biden to quit was once a supporter of Biden and his failed policies that lead to extreme inflation, an open border, and chaos at home and abroad. Make no mistake the Democrats, the mainstream media, and the swamp colluded to hide the truth from the American public. Then he goes on to say, Joe Biden is weak, failed, dishonest, and not fit for the White House. Every one of them has lied about Joe Biden's cognitive state and supported his disastrous policies over the past four years. 
especially cackling co-pilot Kamala Harris. Now, how is that not hot sat Shemrock? I mean, I'd love to hear what I, Ivanka thinks about this. And the point that it actually does more damage to the person that's saying it than the person that receives it, I think is true. The man is consumed with hate. And, it, and it's, it's why he wakes up every day, folks, is because of this hate. And it's the, it's the hate that drives the craving for power. It's the hate that drives the craving for the money that comes with it. And that money is what draws the family in to Donald Trump time and time again. It's the money that will continue to bring them in. And with this latest ruling from the Supreme Court, let's face it, what is Donald, the big question is, what is Donald Trump going to do? How is he going to abuse that newfound power should he make it through a second term? But nonetheless, all of the family is going to be sucked in because of that money, and because of that power, and yes, it will suck in Ivanka and Jared and already has. They just don't even know it yet. Till next time, folks.